Imagine waking up in a new world with the memories of your old life and a fierce drive for revenge. Haruto Amakawa's life ended tragically, but his story is far from over. Reborn as Ryo in a magical kingdom, he's thrust into a world of peril where royal politics and dark secrets intertwine. With a promise to his only ally and a mysterious power at his fingertips, Ryo's quest for vengeance and redemption takes flight. Will he rise from the slums to claim his destiny, or will he be consumed by the shadows of his past? Discover the explosive journey of a hero reborn. The story begins with a boy named Haruun, who is preparing to leave his current city for a new one. His childhood friend Mian, with tears streaming down her face, begs him not to go. Haruun quickly takes her hands to comfort her and reassures her that he will return for her when he grows up and marry her, so they can always be together. He promises that even if he were to die, he would protect her. Mian agrees, and Haruun boards a bus which soon becomes involved in a traffic accident resulting in his death. In the kingdom of Beltram in the year 991 during early spring, a boy named Rio awakens from a long slumber in an unfamiliar room. He begins to experience fragmented memories of a past life belonging to a boy named Haruto Amakawa, though he struggles to piece them together. As he tries to make sense of his situation, a group of men enters the room with a large, ominous sack. They are surprised to find Rio still alive as they had expected him to have succumbed to a fever he had the previous day. The men discuss their business while eating, and as Ryo's stomach growls, one of the men calls out to him. Ryo responds with joy, hopeful and eager. Ryo is called to eat, but he protests, saying he smells bad. As he leaves the room, he picks some fruit from a nearby tree. While eating, fragmented memories of Haruto Amakawa's life and death resurface. Despite this, Ryo decides he does not want to be Haruto and resolves to remain as himself, living in the squalor of the slum with the goal of avenging his mother. He recalls his last moments with her, where he questioned why they had black hair. She explained that it was because she and her husband came from a distant place, and she had promised to take him to his grandparents in Yagumo when he was older. Tragically, an unknown killer took her life. Overcome with sorrow, Ryo wipes his tears, cleans his face, and puts on a shirt. A group of women approaches him, but they hesitate to get closer because of the odor. One of them inquires if he has seen a girl with purple hair who is around his age. Ryo responds that he hasn't seen her. The woman decides to address him directly and apologizes for startling him. She introduces herself as Celia and learns that Ryo's parents were immigrants, which explains his black hair. She asks again about the girl, but Ryo's answer remains the same. Celia then asks if they can search the slum for the girl, but Ryo advises against it, saying that it's not a place for well-dressed ladies like them. When Celia asks what kind of clothes people in the slum wear, Rio describes them as tattered and worn. Lady Vanessa suggests they change into more appropriate clothes in return, but Lady Christina insists they need to hurry. Lady Vanessa cautions them to avoid causing a disturbance, which Lady Christina doesn't want. Vanessa then instructs Celia to look for any magical traces in the area. Celia chants Ara and surprisingly, she senses a significant amount of magical energy from Rio. She informs the others that Rio is brimming with magic potential. Lady Vanessa asks if there are any other magical signatures, but Celia confirms that only their own magic and Rio's were detected. The women do not notice the light on him, but Celia quickly returns to offer Rio a token of thanks for his information. Rio opens the small pouch and discovers it contains several valuable silver coins. He glances around, keeps the token, and rushes home to rejoin the others. Upon arriving, he opens the door only to be seized by a masked stranger who attempts to stab him. Fortunately, the token blocks the attack. Both the token and Rio tumble to the ground. The masked man closes the door and advances toward Rio. As Rio surveys the scene, he realizes everyone else is dead. He demands to know who the attacker is. The masked man tries to slash him, but just then, a figure resembling an angel appears before Rio and calls him Haruto. She promises to teach him about magic and how to harness his powers. She gently holds Rio's cheek, instructing him to sharpen his senses. As her touch sparks a radiant light from his body, Ryo manages to dodge another attack from the masked man. He retaliates with a punch to the man's abdomen. The masked assailant chants an incantation to enhance his physical abilities and continues his assault, but Ryo eventually overpowers him, throwing him to the ground. The man's mask falls off, revealing him to be Ryo's former boss. To his shock, Ryo discovers that the man is now dead. Hearing a faint voice from the sack earlier, he quickly opens it to find the small girl the women had been searching for. The girl pleads for help and promises to take Rio to the castle, where her father will reward him. As they head to the castle, the girl spots the dead man and faints. Rio carries her to the castle, where he encounters the women again. Lady Christina, suspecting deception, 
confronts Rio and slaps him. She takes her sister Flora from him, while Lady Vanessa calls Rowana and Celia to assist Flora, who is unconscious but unharmed. Lady Christina accuses Rio of kidnapping her sister, but Rio insists Flora had asked for his help. Lady Vanessa demands a detailed explanation, but Rio maintains Flora was the one who sought his aid. Lady Christina grabs Rio's shirt, and he clenches her hands, urging her to hear him out. Lady Vanessa draws her sword to warn both parties to back off. They release each other, but Lady Christina threatens to charge Rio with Lee's Majestic. Lady Vanessa insists on hearing Rio's account and instructs him to accompany them to the castle. Rio resists, but Lady Vanessa firmly states that it is an order. Rio insists that all he did was rescue the girl. Lady Vanessa informs him that he will need to provide all the information he knows. Although he feels protesting would be futile, he agrees to cooperate but only to talk. Lady Vanessa assures him that if he is innocent he will be released. At the scene of the incident, some royals arrive to investigate. One of the guards informs Sir Alfred that they have found a man still alive. The guards bring out the masked man who is now unconscious. An unknown figure in the crowd breaks an object, causing the masked man to die instantly. The figure confirms the man's death and leaves the scene. At the castle, Rio is suspended and tortured by Charles Arbor, the vice captain of the royal guard. Rio protests, saying he only came to the castle to speak with the ladies. Charles demands that Rio disclose everything he knows about the kidnapping of the second princess. He warns that if Rio cooperates, he will be treated gently and released immediately. Despite this, Rio maintains his innocence, leading to Charles becoming increasingly aggressive. Princess Flora eventually wakes up and is given water by Lady Vanessa and Celia. She recounts the events but is informed by Vanessa that an investigation is underway to verify Rio's testimony. Flora insists that Vanessa summon Rio to her presence, but Vanessa explains that this would require the king's consent. Flora urges her to expedite the arrangements, insisting that Rio should not face any further complications. Vanessa and Celia leave to convey the message. Back in the torture room, Charles continues his harsh questioning, but Rio remains unyielding. A guard informs Charles that Rio might die if the torture continues. Charles expresses concern about the guard's reputation and the potential consequences if they don't restore it. Vanessa and Celia arrive and witness the brutal scene. Charles claims he is conducting a lawful interrogation, but Celia demands that they release Rio. Charles admits it's likely Rio was involved in the kidnapping but is relieved to hear from Vanessa that Princess Flora feels indebted to Rio. Charles orders his guards to release Rio. Celia offers to help but is told not to touch him as he collapses to the ground. Celia feels remorseful and assures Rio she will heal him. Charles permits them to leave, and Vanessa observes as he exits. Rio awakens in a room and asks where he is. Celia informs him he's in the royal palace and checks if he's feeling any pain. Rio is surprised to find he has no injuries. Celia expresses her regret for what he endured and reveals that she was the one who healed him. She also mentions she is studying magic at the Beltram Royal Academy and introduces herself as Celia Calais. Rio thanks her and asks what will happen next. Celia explains that Rio is to be granted an audience with the king, who wishes to thank him personally. Rio requests Celia's assistance in learning the proper manners and protocols for the audience. Celia agrees to teach him, and they shake hands, both looking forward to working together. At the king's palace, Rio is welcomed by the king and the royal family in recognition of his bravery. The king announces that Rio will be granted a scholarship to attend the Royal Academy's primary school. Professor Celia, who will be overseeing his education, informs Rio that they haven't yet assessed his academic abilities. She asks if he can read and write, to which Rio replies that he has never had formal education in writing. In that case, Professor Celia offers to tutor him personally and invites him to her research lab after school. Professor Celia explains that many students at the academy come from royal or noble families, but Rio reassures her that he understands his position. She advises him to come to her with any problems he may face. Celia then leads Rio to the classroom and introduces him as the new transfer student. She asks the class to be welcoming. As the students murmur and make comments, Professor Celia encourages Rio to introduce himself. Rio introduces himself and expresses his gratitude for the opportunity to attend the academy, acknowledging his own shortcomings and hoping for the student's kindness. A student remarks that Rio speaks as well as a servant, and the class laughs. Professor Celia praises Rio for his bravery and tells him to take a seat. She starts the lesson by asking the students to copy down a numerical formula and solve a problem on the board. As the class works, Professor Celia approaches Rio and advises him not to overexert himself. The other students laugh, noting that Rio cannot read. Professor Celia instructs the class to focus on their work and not to make fun of Rio. 
After class, Rio finds Professor Celia's research lab and hears her voice from inside. He knocks on the door. When Professor Celia opens it, she scolds him for not reading the sign, but Rio apologizes, explaining that he cannot read. Realizing it's Rio, Professor Celia acknowledges his apology and invites him in, noting that her office is currently messy. She explains that, despite the clutter, she is usually well organized. As she clears some space, Rio notices her bookshelf and comments on her youthful appearance. Celia admits she is only 12 but skipped grades and graduated from high school early. She gives Rio some calculations to solve, and he completes them quickly. Professor Celia is surprised by his speed, but Rio explains that it's just basic multiplication and division. Celia reveals that only Princess Christina in her class can solve such problems with ease, which leads Rio to recall his own university education and understand why the calculations are easy for him. When Professor Celia asks where he learned arithmetic, Rio tells her it was taught by his late mother. Celia, moved by his story, decides to make some tea. Rio enjoys the tea, finding it to his liking. Professor Celia then asks Rio how his first day at the academy went and if he has any problems. Rio says everything is fine but requests recommendations for children's books to learn letters. Celia agrees to help him find some books. It's training day, and while all other students have partners to practice with, Rio is left to train alone. The master instructs him to strike however he likes. The other students watch as Rio recalls his previous training with his old master. His swordsmanship skills are evident, but the students still make disparaging remarks. After the training, the master tells Rio he has the makings of a knight, but Rio says he is not interested in joining the Knights and thanks him for his kind words. After class, Professor Celia commends Rio for his hard work and reminds him that the end of term exams are approaching. She advises him not to worry too much about his grade since he's just started at the academy, but Rio is determined to do his best. On exam day, Professor Celia tells everyone to do their best. After the exam, Rio exits the classroom and sees students playing on the playground. He has a flashback to a lady named Maikon, and is then reminded of his childhood friend Ayaz Miharu Amakawa. The separation caused by his parents' divorce and Maikon's absence from school still weighs on him. He resolves to accept his new identity as Ryo and to be strong and resilient. When the final exam results are posted, Ryo's name is listed alongside Princess Christina, surprising the students. Alfonso approaches Ryo and questions his presence at the top of the class, implying that a commoner like Ryo doesn't belong there. He accuses Ryo of using tricks, but Princess Christina intervenes, criticizing Alfonso for his jealousy and demanding concrete evidence. Alfonso falls silent, and Christina argues that unfounded accusations tarnish the Academy's reputation. Professor Celia arrives, supporting Rio's achievement as the result of hard work. Alfonso, unconvinced, leaves with his supporters. Rio tries to thank Princess Christina, but she interrupts, saying her intervention was not for his sake. She warns him that he won't beat her next time. Celia congratulates Rio on his exam success and expresses concern that more students might try to find faults with him. Rio reassures her that he is accustomed to such behavior. Celia mentions that bullying by nobles reflects poorly on them and shares her own experiences with similar treatment. Rio asks if anything similar happened to Celia. She recounts facing similar issues from those of higher social standing and their followers, but chose to ignore them. Rio appreciates Celia's support and considers her a friend, though Celia feels he might be teasing her. She says she doesn't mind being thought of as a friend, and Rio requests that she support him both as a teacher and a friend in times of trouble. Celia agrees, adding that she'll comfort him if he feels overwhelmed by bullying. As they talk, Celia mentions that Rio will participate in an upcoming nightly tournament. She suggests that a good performance might attract the attention of the knights even before he graduates. Rio helps her with a book and remarks that he has no intention of becoming a knight. Celia notices he has grown taller, and they discuss their heights and laugh. Back in Celia's lab, Rio makes tea, which she finds tastes different when he makes it. Rio explains that he follows instructions from books. Celia asks what Rio plans to do after graduation if he doesn't want to be a knight. He says he plans to go on a journey to a place he wishes to visit. Celia asks if he plans to leave the country, but Rio replies that living in the country is challenging for him. Celia suggests that he could work at the academy, as things might go awry without him. She also mentions that he often chides her when she gets too absorbed in her research. Rio expresses gratitude for Celia's support but speculates that she will eventually enter marriage talks. Celia denies any plans to marry soon, and Rio reassures her that she can do as she pleases. He compliments her beauty leaving Celia unsure of how to respond. Professor Celia quickly asks Rio where he plans to go after graduation. Rio mentions that he wishes to travel to his parents' homeland, the Yagumo region. Celia notes that Yagumo is located on the edge of the wilderness, 
Ryo is momentarily distracted by thoughts of a promise his mother made to take him to Mo. The day of the tournament between the glorious knights of the realm and the Royal Academy students arrives. Sir Alfred announces himself as the referee, and the crowd applauds. Sir Alfred introduces the first challenger from Beltram Royal Academy Primary School Rio. As Rio steps onto the stage, Alfonso taunts him, warning him not to embarrass himself and lower people's opinions of him. Rio responds that he will do his best to avoid a disgraceful performance. Alfonso dismisses Rio, saying no one expects much from him anyway. Professor Celia cheers for Rio, urging him to stay focused. Sir Alfred announces the first challenger from the Knights of the Royal Guard Charles Arbor, who had previously tortured Rio. Charles comments that he didn't expect the dirty little brat from before to be his opponent. Rio expresses that he feels indebted to Charles for his earlier care and regrets not being able to help more. Sir Alfred calls for the match to begin. Charles, equipped with a shield, feels mocked by Rio's stance, which seems to ignore his own preparation. During the fight, Rio skillfully dodges and blocks Charles's attacks. Charles, driven by a desire for revenge due to his demotion five years ago, fights aggressively. In the end, Rio disarms Charles and points his sword at his chest. Sir Alfred announces Rio as the winner. Charles tries to plead for a rematch, but Sir Alfred insists that a loss is final and instructs him to accept his defeat gracefully. Charles begrudgingly admits his loss, and Rio thanks him for the match. The master and Professor Celia praise Rio, and the crowd applauds as he leaves the stage. That night, Charles, still fuming about the fight, recounts his history with Rio to an unknown man. The next day, Professor Celia hopes to celebrate Rio's victory with him but finds him heading elsewhere. Rio meets a woman who hands him a written account of his fight, praising him for his performance. The woman quickly leaves and Celia, who had been watching from behind a tree, departs as soon as the woman is gone. Professor Celia reviews the student's post-graduation plans and notices that Rio has not written anything. She recalls Rio mentioning his desire to visit the Yagumo region. In class, Professor Celia begins a lecture on magic use explaining the importance of controlling magical power and using formulas. The fifth and sixth year students practice casting lightning spells to better understand magical control. Alfonso and Stuart mock Rio, claiming that only students with poor magic control need such lessons. Celia demonstrates advanced magical control by closing all the classroom windows and casting a spell to illuminate the room with multiple lights. Rio, observing this, realizes that although he cannot perform magical covenants, he can still reproduce magical techniques by imitating the flow of magical power. After class, Stuart accuses Rio of trying to seduce the female students and insists that his victory in the tournament was merely a fluke. Professor Celia intervenes, stating that nobility should not criticize without evidence. Stuart threatens Rio, warning him that if he causes any trouble during the outdoor practicum, Duke Hugo's house will not stay silent. Rio bows respectfully and leaves. Princess Flora, concerned about Rio's treatment, empathizes with him. During the outdoor practicum, students will be tested on military exercises. Flora is nervous, but Rowana reassures her that it's a team competition and that they are prepared for dangerous monsters. Alfonso explains that their unit must travel the shortest path through the mountain forest and reach the goal by sunset. He boasts about having a special route based on knowledge from soldiers in his region. Rowana feels it's unfair, but Alfonso argues that information is key in war. As they travel, Alfonso assigns Rio the task of carrying everyone's luggage. Princess Flora offers to help, but Rio insists he can manage on his own. As they proceed, goblins appear, but Alfonso and the Vanguard students handle them with ease using enchanted artifacts. Rio stands by, initially not participating actively, which Alfonso notices. Meanwhile, unknown figures in the forest contemplate testing Rio's true abilities. The students emerge from the forest and find a cliff blocking their path. As they discuss their options, a spear is thrown from the bushes, nearly hitting Rowana. Orcs reveal themselves and Alfonso orders the vanguard to raise their shields. Rio blocks a spear aimed at him, but Stuart, who is struggling with his shield, is injured when a spear slashes his leg. Stuart, in pain, tries to get assistance from a fellow student, but is pushed away. As Flora is pushed off the cliff, Rio reacts swiftly. He dives after her, activating his power to manipulate energy. With a surge of effort, he propels Flora upwards away from the cliff's edge while he himself falls. Flora lands back on top of the cliff safely and begins searching for Rio, but he is nowhere in sight. The other students, having dealt with the orcs, focus on their exit from the forest. Rio, still falling, contemplates that his ability to survive without injury might seem suspicious. He realizes it's not magic but a unique power he can't fully understand. Meanwhile, he hears the students blaming Stuart for Flora's fall, 
with Stuart trying to shift the blame onto Rio. The commander decides it's best to get out of the forest, dismissing Flora's concerns about finding Rio. Alfonso, feeling that Rio got what he deserved, dismisses the situation, causing Flora to feel disheartened. Determined, Flora decides to help Rio herself. As she continues her search, a massive monster appears, causing the ground to shake with each step. The creature roars and even the commander looks frightened. Princess Christina tries to attack with a Thunderball spell, but the monster deflects the strike. Alfonso suggests using Ice Lance and calls on the Vanguard to enhance their physical abilities. The Vanguard prepares to use the spell, but the monster dodges the attack and retaliates. The students are in chaos as the monster assaults them. Alfonso commands a retreat, while Flora stays behind to heal the wounded. The monster approaches Flora menacingly, but Rio arrives just in time. He engages the beast, slicing off one of its arms and commanding Flora to take the wounded and leave. Rio battles fiercely, delivering a decisive blow that slashes the monster's neck, causing it to vanish. He leaves the scene before the students can recognize him as the one who defeated the monster. The unknown man observing from afar is impressed by Rio's fighting skills. He notes Rio's black hair and deduces that Rio must be of Yagumo descent, explaining his ability to use spirit arts. Amused, he departs. Professor Celia, walking along a path, overhears Sir Alfred and Stuart plotting to blame Rio for the incident with Flora. Concerned, she wonders about the situation. Back in her lab, Rio arrives, apologizing for the commotion. Celia hugs him, checking for injuries. Rio reassures her that he's fine and explains the situation, including the false accusations against him. Celia acknowledges that he hasn't done anything wrong but admits that those in power often have the final say. Rio expresses his gratitude for Celia's support and tells her he is heading to the Yagumo region as planned. Celia reveals she had hoped to see him graduate but understands his decision. Rio promises to send letters under the alias Harud and hopes to see her again. They share a heartfelt goodbye. Meanwhile, Sir Alfred assigns a girl, captured and held hostage, a task to remember the smell of her target, Rio. He describes Rio's appearance and instructs her to find and kill him. The girl agrees to the mission. Three days later, after leaving Beltron and journeying through the forest, Rio reaches the market town of Galar in a neighboring kingdom. He finds a wanted poster with his face on it, noting that he is still being hunted. Despite this, he is relieved that Professor Celia is less likely to worry now that he is in a new location. In the bustling town, Rio explores and finds a vendor selling soup-style pasta. Intrigued by the local delicacy, he buys a bowl and enjoys it, reminiscing about past meals and wondering if Lady Lieselot, who the vendor mentioned, is related to his own experiences. After his meal, he continues to search for the merchant guild described by Lieselot. Rio finds the guild and is greeted by a woman named Elle, who helps him with his purchases and offers him black tea. He comments on the tea's unique aroma and flavor, and Elle explains that their guild's motto is to create the best environment for negotiations. L offers to deliver a letter for Rio, which he happily accepts. He writes to Professor Celia, informing her of his successful purchase and impending departure. He reassures her that no news of him will mean he is safe and well. As Rio prepares to leave, he notices L and Ket discussing his mysterious nature. L is intrigued but maintains her focus on the task at hand. Continuing his journey through the forest, Rio encounters a girl who appears to be in distress. Upon closer inspection, he realizes she is the assassin sent after him. She injects him with poison, but Rio quickly neutralizes it, stabilizing himself. He confronts the assassin, informing her that he cannot let her kill him. The scene ends with tension as the two face off. The fight begins as Rio and the assassin girl, Latifa, dodge each other's attacks. Rio throws small arrows at her, but she evades them with agility. She climbs a tree and chants an enchantment to enhance her physical abilities. Rio, noticing her increased speed, decides to use his flight ability to reach her. Latifa throws small weapons at him, which he blocks with his sword. Latifa attacks from various angles, but Rio manages to disarm her, taking the knife that was her focus. He grabs her and slams her down onto the ground. Her eyes clear as she starts to scream, calling out for her mother and expressing her fear of dying. Rio, realizing that the screaming won't stop, places his hand over her face until she falls asleep. Once she is unconscious, Rio ties her hands and legs to prevent any further attacks. When Latifa wakes up, she is disoriented and notices a collar of submission around her neck. Rio remembers reading about a spell in a book that could remove such collars and tries to imitate it. The collar falls off, and Latifa awakens with a new identity, now named Latifa instead of Endo Suzun. She was forced into accepting a new role and identity by her previous masters. 
Rio wakes Latifa, who is initially disoriented and tries to struggle against her bindings. He warns her not to act violently if she wants to avoid death. Latifa questions if Rio plans to kill her if she doesn't fight, to which Rio replies that her survival depends on her actions. He shows her the broken collar and explains that it was the source of her obedience. Without it, she will no longer experience pain or coercion. Latifa breaks down in tears, realizing that she is now free from the collar's control. Rio asks her about her orders and her master. But she doesn't know her master's name, only that her esteemed older brother is Stuart, whom she describes as a human. Rio deduces that Stuart is the same Stuart from the Academy and that Duke Hugo was behind the plan to eliminate him. Everything seems to fit together. Latifa admits she doesn't think there are others trying to kill Rio. She also says she won't pursue him further. Rio tells her that she is free to leave but advises her to head east to the wilderness, a place where beast people and demi-humans live together. He warns her that he will show no mercy if she attacks him again. Latifa expresses a desire to accompany Rio to the east. Rio clarifies that he didn't free her out of a sense of rescue, but because not killing her was more convenient for him. Latifa admits she doesn't know what to do and asks if she can trust him, but Rio says he is human, just like those who enslaved her, and she should be wary. Latifa requests the collar back, expressing her fear of being alone. Rio tells her to do what she wants and removes the collar from her neck. He introduces himself and asks for her name. Latifa tells him she is Latifa. Rio prepares a meal for them, and Latifa, who has never tasted such food before, cries with joy as she eats. Rio comforts her, and they continue their journey. As they approach the wilderness, Rio suggests they camp for the night. Professor Celia receives Rio's last letter with a mixture of relief and sadness knowing she won't hear from him for a while. She hopes he is safe on his journey. That night, Rio cooks spaghetti, which Latifa enjoys immensely. She mentions that she used to eat pasta, and Rio wonders if her use of the term spaghetti means she is from Harrow's side. While they rest, Latifa cries out in her sleep, missing her family and home, which wakes Rio. He comforts her, and she expresses a longing to return to Tokyo. The next morning, Latifa sees Rio's black hair and screams, realizing he resembles someone from her past. She calls him Oni-chan and requests omelets with cheese for breakfast. Ryo notices a large tree nearby that seems to be magically concealed from view. He considers investigating it, but Latifa, sensing something, is scared. They decide to stay put for the day. At night, while Ryo sits by the campfire, Latifa has terrifying dreams. Ryo uses his magic to soothe her. Suddenly, the light from the campfire extinguishes. Ryo steps outside and sees a wolf, which transforms into several demi-humans emitting blinding light. One of them, named Uzuma, attacks Ryo. Ryo, using his spirit art, detects the presence of the demi-humans in the area. Sara tells Uzuma to retreat due to Ryo's ability. Ryo asks if they are demi-humans, hoping to speak with them. Uzuma, viewing humans with disdain, responds that they are indeed demi-humans and Sara acknowledges this but insists they need to understand Ryo's intentions. Uzuma prepares for the worst case, instructing Oria and Alma to investigate inside the camp. Sara steps forward to address Rio, confirming that they are willing to hear him out but requests that he refrain from referring to them as demi-humans. Rio thanks her for their willingness and introduces himself, apologizing for any offense caused. Meanwhile, Oria and Alma find a child of the beast people among the camp members and note that Rio used spirit arts to make her sleep. Uzuma approaches Rio and strikes him with a spear. Sara interjects, stating that Uzuma has not been authorized to attack. Uzuma, identifying Ryo as a kidnapper of their kin, continues her assault. Ryo uses spirit art to heal himself, but Uzuma persists in her attacks. He draws his sword to block her strikes and tries to explain that he intended to protect the child, not harm her. Uzuma, however, remains skeptical of a human's word. Elma uses magic to pin Ryo's leg to the ground and Uzuma electrocutes him into unconsciousness. When Ryo wakes, he finds himself in a room with his hands bound. He calls out for Mekan repeatedly, and Alma and Oria check on him. Latifa, in tears, rushes to Ryo and asks why he is restrained. She expresses her fear that he might be gone and pleads with him not to leave her. Sara and Uzuma enter the room with another elder, who apologizes for the incident and expresses a desire to hear about Latifa. Latifa asks if they were responsible for Ryo's restraints. Uzuma bows deeply and offers her sincerest apologies. The other three also apologize. Ryo, emphasizing the need to resolve the misunderstanding, accepts their apologies. The elder assures Ryo that Uzuma and the others will take full responsibility for their actions. She then instructs Oria to release the shackles from Ryo's hands. The elder informs him that the elders will formally apologize the following day, 
but for now they can only offer him a modest room. Rio and Latifa graciously accept. The next morning, the elder guides Rio to the elder gathering. Upon seeing a large tree, Rio asks about it. The elder explains that it is the world tree, home to Draws, a powerful spirit of the trees. Rio, realizing that this tree has been central to his journey, acknowledges its significance. The elder notes that a high-level illusion magic barrier surrounds the tree, and without knowledge of spirit arts, it would be invisible. Rio mentions that he used spirit arts, having self-educated in their practice. At the elder gathering, Rio is offered a seat, and the elders introduce themselves. Rio expresses his gratitude for their courtesy and apologizes for the trouble caused by his presence. Salora, the head elder, acknowledges their misunderstanding and thanks Rio for freeing one of their kin from slavery. The elders express their heartfelt gratitude and apologize for the trouble caused. Rio, honored by their words, suggests that the fault lies with him for unintentionally entering their domain. He tells them to lift their heads and adds that he would appreciate it if they could care for Latifa. Ursula, another elder, agrees to this request, stating that it is their wish to show their gratitude. Rio bows in appreciation and Ursula reassures him that they are the ones who should be grateful. Latifa, having grown attached to her new surroundings, will be taken into the care of the demi-humans, ensuring her safety and well-being. Ursula, Understanding Rio's concern suggests that he stay in the village for a while for Latifa's sake. All the elders in the gathering agree, and Ursula adds that Rio's presence will not be inconvenient for them. Dominic praises Rio, stating that he is even better than Ursula described and admits that he likes him. Solora assures Rio that they will take every measure to ensure his stay is comfortable and encourages him to let them know if he needs anything. Dominic even jokingly suggests that Rio could marry one of their girls, but Ursula tells him to not get carried away. Rio expresses his interest in learning more about spirit arts and useful knowledge for daily life during his stay. Ursula assures him that this won't be a problem, and Salora mentions they will need to find a skilled teacher. As the conversation wraps up, a new voice interrupts, introducing a ladylike figure who appears behind Rio. The elders recognize her immediately and inform Rio that this is Lady Draws, the spirit of the world tree. Lady Draz greets Rio and senses a weak presence of a spirit within him. She inquires if Rio knows anything about it, but he doesn't have any recollection of a covenant. Lady Draz finds this unusual, explaining that a covenant with a spirit often leads to difficulties with magic, which can be challenging for humans. She asks if she can investigate further, and Rio agrees. Lady Draz examines Rio and reveals that he has an incredible amount of OD'd spiritual energy hidden within him, noting its beauty. She inquires if he is human, and upon further inspection, she determines that there seems to be a person-shaped spirit residing within him. Lady Draws explains that person-shaped spirits are of the second highest class or greater, and the highest class spirits, known as the Six Great Spirits, went missing over a thousand years ago during the Divine Demon War. The spirit within Rio may be one of these high class spirits. Rio asks if this will cause any problems and Lady Draws says no, but it might be significant for the children of the village. She explains that despite being a spirit of the second highest class, she has been deified by the villagers. The elders, upon hearing this, reconsider their approach to Rio and discuss treating him with the utmost respect, possibly even considering him a saint. Lady Draws then takes Rio to his new residence, where Latifa excitedly greets him with a hug. The house is impressive, featuring an open-air bath, a kitchen, and a beautiful view. They are served orza grains, a foodstuff from the Agumo region which Latifa enjoys before falling asleep. Sara, one of the villagers, asks Rio which room he prefers, but he seems confused. Sara clarifies that three ladies will live with him and Latifa to take care of them. Latifa is surprised by this, and Lady Dras questions if she doesn't want them there. Latifa is unsure how to respond. Rio requests that everyone stop using Sir with him, and the ladies switch to addressing him as Master Rio, which he seems to like. Rio and Latifa are integrated into village life and treated as one of their own. They participate in daily activities and Rio learns more about controlling magic. The time for the annual Grand Spirit Festival arrives, where villagers, including Rio and Latifa, gather at the shrine for the ritual. They pray for blessings and divine protection. Lady Draz makes an appearance and the villagers cheer. Meanwhile, an unknown man named Master Rice and his guard are seen descending into a cave. Master Rice retrieves a large egg and instructs his guard to be cautious as they leave. Master Rice mentions that the cave's master, who will be out looking for food, won't return for a while. They climb aboard a large bird, and Master Rice reassures his guard that the distance to the straw region is considerable, so the parent of the egg is unlikely to pursue them. Master Rice laughs as they depart, 
Back at the festival, Rio is welcomed as a sworn friend and Latifa is celebrated as a resident of the village with a blessing from Lady Draws. The villagers enjoy the feast, and Latifa, Sarah, and Oria are particularly affectionate toward Rio, though they seem tipsy. Rio, feeling less social, hopes he'll do better in the future. Lady Ursula comments that Latifa appears to be having fun and Rio agrees, noting she has become an integral part of the village. As the night progresses, Rio decides to tell Latifa about his plans to leave soon. Lady Ursula expresses that she will miss him and feels it might be a bit too soon, but it could also be the right time. It's late, and Master Rice and his guards settle in the forest for the night, planning to depart for Straw the following morning. Master Rice ties a griffin to a tree and gives his guard a red artifact for protection. He instructs the guard to use it to signal his location if needed and emphasizes the importance of taking care of the egg. Master Rice then heads off, hoping the birds will come for the egg as planned. Back in the village, Rio takes Latifa for a walk, but she notices he's quiet and asks what's wrong. Rio apologizes and suggests they head back to the plaza. As there are still plenty of food and drinks left, Rio asks Latifa if she enjoys living in the village. She replies that she does and finds it really fun because everyone, including Rio, is here with her. Rio then tells Latifa that he plans to leave the village soon, but she protests, saying she doesn't want to be apart from him. Rio explains that he was originally headed east, but Latifa insists on accompanying him. Rio tells her he can't take her with him because he's going to an unfamiliar place with unknown dangers. Latifa, not wanting to hear any more excuses, walks away. Meanwhile, Sarah reports to the elders about a reaction detected inside the barrier, which Lady Draws also noticed. Elder Sora observes that it seems to be more than just a few reactions. Sarah volunteers to investigate further, and Lady Ursula instructs her to take warriors with her. Master Rice arrives at the cave, finding a cache of eggs. He remarks that everyone seems to be leaving without anyone left behind, noting their impressive pursuit skills but lack of intelligence. He then begins collecting the eggs from the cave. Ozuma detects suspicious and odd reactions and Sarah inquires about their location. Ozuma identifies two sources, one in the spring, which is a human, and another which is a griffin. Sarah advises against initiating combat and they land near a bush where they suspect Master Rice might be, but instead the ladies encounter the man. Sarah demands he surrender and comply with their instructions. Ozuma asks the man what he's doing there at this time of day. Sarah spots an egg with him and asks what kind it is. In response, the man brandishes a knife to intimidate them, quickly cuts the rope binding the eagle, and escapes with it. Ozuma requests permission to attack, and Sarah acknowledges that it seems unavoidable. They target the griffin, but it evades their attacks and heads toward the village while the man flees. At that moment, wyverns arrive to attack. Ozuma notices a flight of wyverns and alerts Lady Sarah, who wonders why they would come to this place. Aura suggests it might be because of the egg the man had. Sarah decides they cannot let him reach the village and orders Alma and Oria to handle the black wyverns, while she and the others deal with the remaining wyverns. Alma sends someone to inform Mistress Ursula and the others. After collecting the eggs from the cave, Master Rice declares that the man's role is over. He then crushes a red substance in his hand, killing the man who falls from the eagle, which is now pursued by the wyvern. Sarah instructs Alma to deal with the black wyvern and Alma asks if Sarah could lend her bond spirit to help in the fight. Latifa agrees to follow through with what she was told. As she walks through the forest, she reflects on Rio's words. Suddenly, an egg drops from the sky, and a man crashes to the ground. Latifa approaches him, but he's dead. She notices the broken egg, and a massive black wyvern appears in front of her. The wyvern, enraged by the sight of the egg, roars. Meanwhile, Rio returns to the festival, only to find chaos with people running everywhere. He spots Dominic and asks what's happening. Dominic explains that the festival has been cancelled because a flight of wyverns is approaching. He adds that some are currently being held off above the forest, but they might arrive soon. Rio immediately remembers Latifa and rushes into the forest to find her. The black wyvern strikes Latifa against a tree and nearly burns her with fire. Elma arrives just in time to block the fire, then raises her leg to crush them. Elma grabs Latifa and pulls her away. She chants a spell and a lion appears, climbing onto the lion. Elma tells Latifa to stay back. The lion and a wolf engage the black wyvern in combat, while Elma flies high to attack. However, the wyvern is alert and deflects both the attack and Elma, sending her crashing into a tree. Elma realizes that if the wyverns reach the village it will be disastrous. As she contemplates how to buy time, Latifa tries to distract the black wyvern to prevent it from reaching the village, 
claiming to be a villager herself. The wyvern blocks her path with a tree and is about to step on her when Rio arrives. He strikes the black wyvern and quickly rescues Latifa, apologizing for taking so long. They land safely, and Latifa expresses her own apology for running off. Rio assures her that they can talk later and turns to face the wyvern. Rio battles the black wyvern with his bare hands. The wyvern attempts to breathe fire at him, but Rio casts a spell to block it. The spell causes the wyvern's head to explode, killing it. Sarah and the others arrive and commend Elma for her efforts, but she points out that Rio defeated the wyvern single-handedly. One of them suggests that the other wyverns must have retreated because their leader was defeated. Sarah notes that wyverns are naturally timid and won't challenge those they can't defeat. Facing Rio, Sarah thanks him. Rio and Latifa apologize to each other for not handling the situation better. Latifa reveals that she knew Rio might leave one day. She confesses she was scared of being a burden and wondered if she was a hindrance. Rio reassures her that she is neither troublesome nor a hindrance, calling her his little sister. He then explains he's heading east towards the Yagumo region, because it's where his late parents came from, though he doesn't reveal more. Latifa is touched, saying this is the first time Rio has shared something personal. She also shares that she used to be human and was reincarnated, having lived in Japan before. Rio believes her, as he was also from Japan. He admits he has regrets but is determined to be strong and survive, which is another reason for his journey to Yagumo. Latifa vows to become stronger and wait for him. Before Rio departs, the elders honor him with gifts. Dominic gives him a mithril sword that absorbs spirit arts and an armor made from the hide of the black wyvern, which is stronger than metal armor. Lady Ursula provides secret medicines and elixirs from the elves, and the beast people contribute food and drink. Despite being burdened with these items, Rio is grateful. Elder Solora gives him a space-time cachet, though Rio initially hesitates, feeling it's too precious. Solora reminds him he's their sworn friend. Rio packs his belongings into the cachet and promises to return if the village faces danger. Latifa wishes him a good trip and everyone else does too. He asks them to take care of Latifa, hugging her tightly before leaving. Rio reaches the Yaguma region, but after two weeks he hasn't found any leads on his parents. He encounters a group of farmers and introduces himself as a traveler looking for someone. He requests to meet the head of the village. A young woman named Ruri offers to help and leads him to her grandmother's house. Ruri introduces Rio to her grandmother, Yuba. Yuba, noticing Rio's unusual attire, listens as Rio explains he's seeking information about his parents. Yuba introduces herself and asks for more details. Rio reveals his parents lived in the Yagumo region for over 15 years. Yuba recognizes the names Zen and Ayami and asks Ruri and Sayo to return to work before continuing. She then asks Ryo for more details. Ryo shares that his father died before he was old enough to remember, and his mother died when he was five. He came to Yagumo hoping to find his parents' graves, as he promised his mother he would visit the region. Yuba confirms she knew his parents and takes Ryo to their graves. He pays his respects. Yuba explains that Zen and Ayami had to leave the country in secret, and the graves were made by those who knew the truth. Rio inquires about the reasons, but Yuba says she cannot disclose them now, though she might in the future. She asks if Rio will stay in the village until then, and he agrees. Yuba reveals that all her relatives have died, leaving only Ruri, who is Rio's cousin and 15 years old. Rio notes that Ruri is a year older than him, and Yuba comments on his maturity. Yuba suggests heading home, but Rio asks to stay at the grave a little longer. Yuba tells him to drop the formalities and warns him not to stay out too late. She also says she'll keep his lineage a secret for now. Although it's late, Yuba and Ruri have prepared dinner for him. The next morning, Ryo wakes up early, eager to help around the village and to start preparing breakfast. Yuba is pleased with his motivation. Ruri, forgetting that Ryo is now staying with them, comes out with her body partially uncovered. When she notices Ryo, she quickly retreats to her room, Realizing her lapse, Yuba reminds her that there are now other people in the house. While Rio is preparing breakfast, Yuba mentions that Ruri will make miso soup, but they're short on ingredients. Ruri informs them that Sei and Shin will be visiting and directs Rio to use water from another container that's refilled daily with spirit arts. Rio decides to use spirit magic to heat the water, impressing Ruri, who notes that even her grandmother can't do that. Rio offers to teach her the trick if she's interested, and she eagerly agrees. Sei and Shin arrive shortly after, and breakfast is served. Yuba introduces them to Ryo. Everyone enjoys the meal and Ruri praises Ryo for preparing everything. They are surprised and pleased with the meal. Ryo offers them more food if they're still hungry. 
After the meal, Yuba asks Shin to take Ryo to Doa's place because she's considering having Ryo become a hunter. Doa needs help and Yuba believes Ryo, given his travels and ability to use spirit arts, is strong enough for the job. Shin is skeptical about Ryo's stamina for the grueling work, but Yuba argues that Ryo's experience and skills make him more than capable. Shin agrees to take Ryo hunting but warns him not to be a hindrance. While Ryo and Shin are out hunting, they manage to catch more animals than usual. Doa notes that they'll have more meat for the village than expected. Ryo manages to take down more animals than Shin, leading Shin to feel that Ryo and Dio are the real contributors. However, Ryo insists that their success is due to teamwork. Shin leaves in frustration, but Doa says he'll speak with Shin and ask if Ryo can start helping from the next day. Ryo agrees and, after returning home, uses spirit arts to create a bathing area with soap and water. Sayo and Ruri are surprised by this and ask if he used spirit arts to make it. Ryo confirms and offers to clean up afterward, but Ruri tells him it's not necessary. They both enjoy his new scent and ask him about it. When Shin and his friends arrive and see the setup, they ask about it. Sayo explains that Ryo created the bath. Shin starts to develop resentment toward Ryo, accusing him of trying to show off. Ruri and Sayo defend Ryo, with Ruri noting that despite his appearance, Ryo is quite strong. Shin is left embarrassed and speechless. Next, Ryo helps with farming, attracting attention from the village women. Yuba is pleased with the good crop yield and asks Ryo for a favor. After the annual tribute and rationing, the remaining rice will be sold in the royal capital, and Yuba asks Ryo to guard the transport team. Ryo agrees. Say, Suddenly, some boys run into town shouting that Gan, the son of the neighboring village's head, and his men have come to cause trouble. Gan and his men attempt to assault Ruri and Sayo, but Shin and his group are there to defend them. Gan claims his cart broke down on his way to the royal capital, and he'll need time to repair it. Ruri offers him one of their guest huts, but Gan, with a smirk, suggests that it might be because she's interested in him. He sees Shin's involvement as jealousy and challenges him. Shin, angered, tries to attack Gan but is stopped by Gan, who grabs him by the neck until Yuba and Ryo arrive to intervene. Yuba apologizes for Shin's behavior and blames Gan for his impudent actions. Yuba offers Gan a guest hut at the village's edge, but with the condition that he must remain there. Gan agrees and as he and his men are leaving, they encounter Ryo. Gan, distracted, accidentally bumps into Ryo and falls. Ryo asks if he's okay, but Gan doesn't respond and quickly leaves. Yuba reassures everyone, instructing them to return quietly to their homes and informing them that Gan and his men are forbidden from leaving the hut. Shin asks Yuba if Sayo can stay with her for a while. Although it's just the two of them living together, Shin believes Sayo would feel safer with Uda and Ryo. Uda agrees with him. That night, Ryo gives Ruri and Sayo protective amulets, which they gratefully accept. Gan and his men discuss how they've made sure to break their cart thoroughly, so they'll have a whole day to repair it at their leisure. Gan adds that the real fun will come afterward. The next day, a tax examiner named Saga Hyate and his men arrive at Madame Yuba's village. Yuda welcomes them and Ryo introduces himself and extends a warm welcome. Hyate inspects the crops and joins them for a meal, which he enjoys. Outside, Ryo trains without his shirt, using a sword. Noticing he's being watched, he remarks that observing him like that can't be much fun. Ruri smiles and praises his technique. She inquires about his interest in martial arts and Ryo hesitates feeling embarrassed. Ruri and Sayo are eager to know more, so Ryo puts on his shirt and explains that he started training to become strong enough to protect a girl he liked when he was younger. Ruri asks about the girl's current situation, but Ryo says they've lost touch. He speculates that she might be with someone else now and isn't sure if she remembers him. Ruri suggests they might meet again someday if she's still alive. Ryo concludes that he's now training for his own sake. That night, while Sayo and Ruri are asleep, Gan sneaks into their room. Ruri wakes and sees him. Gan quickly covers her mouth and warns that he's responsible for what happens if she struggles. Sayo wakes up, sees them, and warns Gan to behave, or he'll get punched by Ryo. Gan hears his men being knocked down, and a light flashes as Ryo bursts in. Ryo confronts Gan in the same spot where Gan's mother was killed. He overpowers Gan, pinning him with his leg against his heart until Gan begs him to stop. Ryo then sits on Gan, pounding his face repeatedly until Lord Hyate intervenes to prevent a killing blow. Yuba takes the girls away from the scene, and Lord Hyate seeks punishment for Gan and his men from the kingdom. He orders a messenger to be sent. This is the second time Ryo has felt a desire to kill, and he's been subconsciously drawn closer to Amakawa Haruto. He hits his fist against a tree, lamenting his focus on revenge despite being similar to the man he despises. 
The following morning they receive word that a messenger from the kingdom will arrive and Gan and his men will be taken into custody. Ryo apologizes for the trouble he's caused and Yuba thanks him for protecting Ruri and Sayo. The group enjoys breakfast together and with Lord Hyate's intervention, Gan and his men will be sent to the royal capital's prison camp, allowing Yuba's transport team to set out safely. Yuba expresses her deep gratitude to Lord Hyate, who humbly responds that he was merely fulfilling his duties. Yuba then requests a favor to personally deliver an important letter to his esteemed father, Lord Giwi. Hyate agrees to help and bids them farewell, including Ryo. Several days later, they arrive at the royal capital of Karasuki and find accommodations. Uda advises them to go out with a local guide to avoid getting lost. He asks Shin and Ryo to join him, and they agree. Uda takes them to a restaurant where he playfully ruffles Shin's hair, telling him it's time for a change of emotions. Shin, embarrassed, asks Uda to stop, noting that Ryo is watching. The waiter serves them large portions of Kutan, a dish Ryo hasn't heard of before. Shin explains that it will quickly become a favorite once he tries it, sharing how he first experienced it. He adds that slurping the Kutan dynamically is the classy way to enjoy it. Du advises Ryo to eat his food while it's still hot, warning him that it might get soggy otherwise. Ryo enjoys the meal. After finishing, Shin and Ryo leave the restaurant. Shin thanks Ryo for saving Sio and mentions that he needs to ensure his sister gets a chance to eat there as well, to avoid any future conflicts. Ryo and Sayo are sent on an errand. Ryo asks Sayo if she would like to grab some kutan after they're done. He explains that Shin suggested he take her if possible, as they've previously had a disagreement over making it because Sayo had never heard of it before. Ryo explains that Shin simply wants to give her a chance to try it while they chat. A souvenir vendor approaches Ryo, suggesting he buy a gift for his cute girlfriend Sayo quickly corrects her, saying they are not a couple. The vendor remarks that they look great together and invites them to check out a souvenir from the capital. Ryo asks Sayo if there's anything she wants, but she declines, saying she's fine. Ryo insists she shouldn't mind, given all she's done for him. The vendor advises Sayo that accepting the gift graciously is a sign of courtesy. Sayo chooses a fine item, and when the vendor asks Ryo for his opinion, he says it suits her. The vendor then quotes a price of two lesser silver tablets. Sayo seems hesitant but the vendor offers a small discount when she notices her reaction. Ryo, however, prefers not to haggle over a gift and agrees to the price. The vendor thanks him and comments that she wished she had set a higher price. As Ryo and Sayo prepare to leave, the vendor whispers to Sayo to do her best to win him over, hinting at competition for his affections. Suddenly, a commotion occurs as a group of men tries to abduct a woman. A bystander attempts to help but is unable to reach the scene. Ryo arrives, chases down the assailant and rescues the woman. He checks on Sayo, who confirms she's fine. The other woman, who is revealed to be Lady Como, has subdued another attacker. Ryo assesses that Lady Como is unconscious but not in serious danger. The woman apologizes for her ineptitude, and Ryo tells her to convey his apologies to Lady Como when she awakens. Ryo then quickly leaves with Sayo to avoid further trouble. Lord Guki reports to Sin Hyate about the near abduction of Lady Como and the young man who intervened. He reminds Hayate that he wanted to speak privately. Hayate produces a letter from Lady Yuba and gives it to Lord Guki. Upon reading it, Lord Guki inquires if Hayate has met someone named Ryo. Meanwhile, Ryo and Sayo return from their errand and encounter others cleaning horses. Sayo mentions to her brother that the Kutan was delicious, and Shin promises to make some for him when they return to the village. Shin notices a hairpin in Sayo's hair and asks about it, but she is unsure of its origin. Ryo decides to put away their purchases and is called Lord Ryo as he turns to see Lord Hyate, his wife Kyoko, and a man bowing to him. The man introduces himself as Saga Guki and his wife Kyoko. Guki explains that he and his wife were once attendants to Ryo's mother, Lady Karasuki Ayami. Guki reveals that Ryo's mother was from the royal family of the kingdom of Karasuki. Guki recounts how, 20 years ago, during a war with the neighboring kingdom of Raren, Ryo's father, Zen, was a skilled soldier who earned the rank of warrior noble. Guki had once sparred with Zen and was impressed by his skills, which led him to recommend Zen as a guard for the royal family. Lady Aemi, who had a fondness for Zen, was involved in a political marriage proposal with the prince from Raren. When the prince's attendant was killed by Zen, it led to a demand for Zen's execution and a political marriage to Lady Aemi to finalize the truce. Even now, Guki speaks with a shiver, confessing that the mere thought of certain individuals makes his blood boil. 
Ryo inquires whether this was why his mother and father fled together. Kuki confirms that it was indeed arranged secretly by His Majesty the King. The couple left their homeland and time passed with no word from them. Recently, however, Guki received a letter from Lady Yuba, and upon seeing their esteemed faces, he is convinced without a doubt that you are their son. Guki requests that Ryo visit the castle the following day, as it is the king and queen's dearest wish to meet him. Ryo agrees to come the next day. Upon arriving at the castle, he meets King Hora and Queen Shizuku. King Hora suggests that since they are meeting their beloved grandchild, Ryo should feel free to be less formal. Ryo agrees, provided they allow him to do so, and they offer him a seat. Queen Shizuku remarks that Ryo resembles Aim exactly, to which Ryo replies that she, too, looks just like his mother. The queen then asks Ryo to share what he knows about Aim and Zen, preferring to hear the unembellished truth. Ryo reveals that both his parents have passed away. King Hura expresses interest in learning how they lived and died. Ryo recounts that he was too young to know his father well, but his mother was a kind woman who always smiled, hiding her grief over her father's death. They were not wealthy, but their days were filled with happiness. When she died, King Hura inquires about the manner of her death. Ryo admits that the truth is deeply painful his mother was killed right in front of him by a man named Lucius. Lucius, who had been an ally of his father and had helped them after his father's death, murdered his mother after she had told Ryo not to open the door. Ryo recounts how Lucius attacked him and then killed his mother in front of him, leaving him alone in the slums. He survived there as an orphan until he was seven, when an incident involving a person of importance to the kingdom allowed him to attend a prestigious school. Despite harsh treatment from some students, others treated him kindly, allowing him to stay in the school until he was twelve. He then ventured to the land his mother had promised to show him. King Hira remarks that both his parents must have harbored deep resentment. Ryo replies that while his mother might have been grateful for marrying his father, she could not hate them for that. The one person he cannot forgive is Lucius. King Hura asks if Ryo seeks revenge, and Ryo admits that while revenge once drove him, it ultimately leads nowhere. However, he would not hesitate to take action if he ever encountered Lucius. King Hura advises that pursuing revenge will only lead to hell, but he won't prevent Ryo from trying. He does, however, suggest that Ryo should spar with Guki to gain the strength needed for facing Lucius one day. When Ryo and Guki return home, they encounter Lady Kimomo, Guki's daughter, whom Ryo had previously saved. Both Guki and his wife are delighted and surprised. A duel is set up between Guki and Ryo, officiated by Kyoko, with the king and queen in attendance. The match showcases impressive sword skills from both sides. Guki uses his, his hidden skill, First blade air splash but Ryo counters with his spirit art. The bout ends with Ryo emerging victorious, impressing the king and queen. King Hura asks if Ryo has any wishes, to which Ryo replies that he has a cousin in the village where he has been staying. He wishes to inform her of his royal lineage. The king agrees to leave this decision to Ryo's judgment, and Ryo expresses his gratitude. Back in the village, Ruri cannot find them. Sayo calls Ruri to look up at the mountain, where he confesses to his parents that he can no longer run or protect what's precious without accepting the ugliness within himself. That evening in the village, Yuba and Ryo reveal to Ruri that Ryo is her cousin. Ruri, initially shocked, jokes about the surprising revelation. Yuba clarifies that while Ryo's royal status is not officially recognized, he is indeed of royal blood. Ruri apologizes for her rudeness and bows to Ryo, but Yuba tells her to drop the formalities. Ruri asks if she can call him simply Ryo and he agrees hoping to continue their relationship. She finds it awkward to be called Miss Ruri, and prefers a more familiar address which Ryo agrees to, though he mentions it might take some time for him to get used to it. Ryo tells both Yuba and Ruri that he plans to leave the village by the same time next year. Yuba says he will be missed but understands. She asks if he plans to return to his homeland, and Ryo confirms he does, but he also wants to stop by somewhere along the way. Ruri asks if he will come back to the village again someday, and he replies that he would like to if permitted. Ruri assures him he is always welcome, and Yuba adds that he is a member of the village and can return any time. Ruri speculates that since Ryo plans to stop somewhere, someone might be waiting for him there. Ryo mentions that while they are not related by blood, there is someone who thinks of him as an older brother. Ryo meets with Ruri and Sayo at their usual spot, addressing Ruri as agreed. He mentions that he hasn't had the chance to properly greet everyone since his return and wishes to visit each person. Ruri notices the expressions on Sayo and the other women's faces and asks what's wrong. Sayo explains that a lady questioned why Ryo is speaking to Ruri so familiarly. Ruri clarifies that since they live in the same house, she asked Ryo to drop the formalities. Other women express jealousy, 
wishing they could be on such terms with Ryo. Ryo continues his daily activities in the village and enjoys his time with the villagers. Rory calls him to say she has planted the seedlings as he instructed. Ryo praises her and advises her to help others who haven't finished. Do comments on Rory's hard work, suggesting she will make a good bride. Ryo agrees, and they share a laugh. Rory, however, asks them not to joke like that. Ryo then approaches Miss Sayo, asking if he can assist her, but she continues planting and says she isn't paying attention. Ryo tells her to remember everything he has taught her and mentions that he'd like to supervise everyone in the village in his absence. Sayo pauses and Ryo explains that his departure depends on whether things turn out well. Sayo asks if he's leaving the village, and he confirms he plans to leave around the end of the harvest festival this fall. She inquires if he will stay nearby and return regularly, but he says he plans to travel across the country, making regular visits uncertain. He feels it's better to inform her well in advance. Sayo worries but tries to hide it, claiming dirt from her hands got into her eyes. Ryo uses his water spirit art to help her wash her face. Ruri asks what happened, and Sayo explains the same story she told Ryo. She then decides to finish her planting, with Ruri offering to help. Back at home, Sayo bursts into tears. Shin finds her crying and, suspecting Ryo is the cause, is about to confront him. Sayo reassures him that Ryo did nothing wrong but is simply leaving the village. Shin rushes to Madame Yuba's place to plead with Ryo to stay. He acknowledges that his request is selfish but begs Ryo not to leave. Sayo arrives, apologizes for her brother's behavior, and they both head back home. At the Harvest Festival, everyone enjoys the festivities. Madame Yuba invites the Guki family to join in the fun. Guki decides to hold a challenge, stating that rank and size are irrelevant. While some cheer for Guki, others push Du onto the stage to face him, even though he is reluctant. Guki wins the challenge, and Ryo shares Kutan with everyone. Ruri invites Komo to join them for Kutan, and Ryo thanks Lady Kyoko for her help, to which she responds that it was the least she could do. Sayo asks for a private moment with Ryo, and they move away from the party to talk. Ryo notices the hairpin and remarks that she's still using it. As the conversation shifts to a more serious topic, she admits her love for Ryo. Ryo feels regretful but explains that he cannot reciprocate her feelings. When she asks if his departure from the village is the reason, he confirms it's part of it, though not the whole reason. She then proposes that he should take her with him. Ryo replies that it's not possible despite her assurances that she has worked hard to avoid being a burden, having trained her body and practiced her spirit arts every day for the last six months. She promises to do everything in her power to not hold him back. Ryo insists that it's not about her being a burden and repeats his apologies for not returning her feelings. Tears stream down her face as she accepts his decision, saying that even if he never looks at her or does anything for her, she simply wants to stay by his side. She holds his hand, but Ryo, feeling sorry, gently releases it and leaves, he notices Shin watching and quietly apologizes to Master Shin before continuing. As Ryo prepares to leave, he thanks Madame M, Yuba, and Ruri. Madame Yuba advises him not to set out in the dark, but Ryo explains that he bade farewell to everyone in the village the day before, and that the journey will be long. Ruri tells him he can always return home, and the villagers wish him a good trip. At the village border, CEO waits for Ryo. Reflecting on Lord Guki's advice and her own tears when Ryo left, she wishes him well and urges him to take care of himself. Ryo assures her he will and hopes she does the same. She promises to work hard and do her best, and they shake hands and say goodbye, hoping to meet again. Upon returning, Ryo is greeted warmly by Latifa, who hugs him tightly. He updates the elders on his experiences, mentioning that his grandmother and cousin are eager to meet Latifa. Latifa expresses interest in meeting them as well. Elder Solora asks how long Ryo will stay, and he estimates a few months, promising to return sooner next time. Elder Ursula inquires if he needs anything, and Ryo mentions a desire to build a portable house using space-time magic. Dominic finds the idea intriguing, but Ursula suggests that a foundation-free house would be needed, and that spirit arts might be required. Elder Solora warns that once Ryo decides on this, he might not return for a while. Ursula advises Ryo to leave the house project to Dominic and to spend as much time as possible with Latifa and the others. After speaking with the elders, Ryo meets with the ladies. Sarah asks if he had a good talk with the eldest, and Ryo replies affirmatively, noting that everyone seems lively as ever. Sarah remarks on how grown up Ryo looks, and Oria comments on how Elma and Sarah seem a bit shy around him, which they deny. Ryo compliments Alma and Sarah on their maturity and beauty, and tells Oria that her calm aura has only grown stronger. Latifa then asks if he would join them for a bath, 
to which the ladies respond with a chorus of of course not. Rio wakes up to find a naked woman beside him and panics. The ladies rush in, surprised by the scene. 